Right, it's time for another sewing and growing video and I'm doing it in the greenhouse this week because I've got so much here to plant out. So when I'm talking about what I'm sowing in January, it's important to think about what I've already sown in autumn and got ready to plant out now, which does reduce the amount that I really need to sow in January. And I am growing under grow lights. So, you know, that's why I've got a lot of this sort of lush growth in the greenhouse. I've got these two old grow lights here um, that are no longer any use in the house, but still pretty good out here. And I've got a couple of grow lights at home as well. So yeah, bear that in mind and bear out where I'm planting out because I'm not planting out outside under fleece or anything like that at this time of year. I'm only planting out under cover, under plastic, uh, generally under low tunnels, coal frames and the polytunnel. So I'm gonna pull this up on my iPad and hopefully you'll be able to see it on the side of the screen now, maybe that side. So first off are the kales. I really, I, we eat kale pretty much every week. So we really like to have a nice continuous supply of kale. And so I tend to do a, a sowing always at the beginning of January. That's kind of ready for harvest, sort of beginning of May, maybe the end of April, depends how the weather goes. And, you know, we harvest that all the way through until the main crop kale is ready. So the stuff we sow in March is ready. That tends to be about the beginning of July. Then we take those beds out, replant them, and just eat our main crop kale then for that, from that point onwards. But it's just nice to have kale just for that short period of time. And it's a bit of a fun thing to sow. I've tried lots of different varieties. What I find now, the, by far the best varieties are these dwarf green uh, and reflex curly kales. They do really well. Uh, so I've done, I would do a, quite a few of those. I've got a few of them now for a sort of spring harvest, early spring harvest. I've tried the Tuscan kales. What I find about those is they do tend to go to seed uh, pretty early in um, sort of May. And so they're nowhere near as good as the curly kales. I haven't tried these, which are the Pentland Brig kales, but I'm gonna try them this year. So again, all these cows I'm showing you now are just the ones that I've got for my spring harvest of sort of small tender leaves. Next up, I've got the red ruble. So I really like red ruble in salads. It's a, I think it's a really nice salad kale and I've got quite a bit of it here. Uh, I'm just growing it to maturity in these big trays because you know it's pretty prolific. Uh, it's great in uh, adding a bit of colour and crunch to the salad mixes in winter. And two trays is basically all I need uh, for that. I just harvest it every other week and it does really nicely. Peas. Well, peas are one of my absolute favourite things to do early, but I don't tend to do them over winter. I don't really have space to do that. Everything's full of veg that's going to be harvested in winter and sort of early spring. So I don't really have any bed space for peas. Uh, but what I tend to do is at the end of January, so this sowing is the beginning of January, at the end of January, I'll plant a row of peas out at the back of one of my low tunnels. And they absolutely thrive in there because they get the protection from the low tunnel, from the wind, extra heat, of course, from the low tunnel. Uh, they sit right at the back, so they don't really get in the way of the existing crop. And I take the low tunnel off in sort of April time. And by then the peas are kind of pretty big, about this sort of size, and I kind of thrive and really romp away. And we get a really nice kind of early harvest, maybe a couple of weeks later than overwintered peas, but not very much later. And of course I've had the benefit of that ground for growing over winter. I have though just tried a few of these meteor peas, not very many, just to go in a pot in the corner in this greenhouse to see if I can get a slightly earlier harvest from those. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So next up, just do a few celeries. So we generally like to have just a few stems of celery uh, each week all the way through the year. And so I'm doing giant red celery and Utah. Both do pretty well, not very fussed about celery, celery varieties. But I start them nice and early in January, go on to grow lights for a few weeks, uh, and then go into sort of a you know, frost-free place. So it's either in this greenhouse or somewhere in the house uh, until probably about April time, and I'll plant them out in the polytunnel beds. Um, they're just then coming ready for harvest uh, in May, 
when the overwintered stuff is basically finishing. Right, so let me just interrupt myself to talk about sort of how to get your head around the complexity of all of these different successions and where they're all going and how they're all growing and all of that sort of thing. And the best place to go is my newsletter. So you can find that at steve.richards.substack.com. And this every week I have a newsletter that goes through all the details, like what I'm sowing, what's germinated that week, what's been pricked out, what's been potted on, what's been planted, as well as more sort of general advice in terms of like growing guides that are relevant to that month, jobs to do that month or that week, um, and just sort of like general uh, topics like diseases and pests and, and all of that sort of thing. So yeah, each newsletter is quite nice. Uh, well, I think it's quite nice, put quite a lot of effort into doing that. And there's loads of links to videos and things like that in the newsletters as well. Uh, so it's kind of like a one-stop shop for everything. And of course, I've also got my ebook, uh, which is very comprehensive. I don't know how many pages it's got, like six or 700 pages or something like that. And so it's quite intimidating to sort of just like dive into that ebook, try and find out what you need. But the newsletter will have links to all the relevant bits of the ebook for the week or month that we're in. So uh, it's also just a good way to sort of keep dip into the ebook basically and read the specific bits and pieces that are relevant. So anyway, let's get back to the video. So it gives us a nice continuous harvest and then we're on to the peppers. So I do have peppers here, which I've actually brought into the greenhouse from the house. They've all just germinated. So I actually don't need this batch of peppers that I've got in this guide. It's here kind of as a E to memoir really to say, if those don't germinate, then get, plant another batch, sow another batch. But they've all germinated, so I don't need these. So these are just a quarter of my peppers. So they're just the really early ones that are gonna go in the conservatory to start off with. And then when it warms up a bit in April, I'll move them into this uh, greenhouse and I'll just grow on maybe six uh, peppers and three or four chili plants or something like that. Uh, just for a really nice early harvest to eat fresh. And then we're on to, oh yeah, and then I do, which is, I'll talk about the others later uh, in the February video, but I do most of my peppers in February. Uh, in the past, I've tried to do them more in January, but I find the plants are just so big and they get a little bit leggy uh, by doing them so early. So just a little bit later, the plants are healthier. I've got my fresh harvest anyway, uh, so I don't really worry about that. But the ones that I'm going to be using, all my preserves and freezing them and all of that sort of thing, all of those I do just that little bit later. Um, say so just reduces the amount of space I need, makes my life easier doesn't really compromise the harvest at all. So next up are the beetroot. So I do like again to do an early batch of beetroot. I get it probably three weeks earlier than I would if I started it in February, which is not a huge amount, but we eat beetroot every week. Uh, and we generally sort of running out of beetroot in the store by the time we get to sort of like the beginning of May. So it's really nice to have that early beetroot crop. And of course the beetroot leaves are really lovely as well. And I'm doing Pablo. And for the first time this year, I'm doing Burpees Golden. Don't normally do these uh, golden beetroots quite so early, but they are going in the polytunnel. So they should be okay. And the nice thing about the Burpees Golden, I always think is the leaves are so incredibly lovely. And there's not a lot of point growing, for example, chard early. It tends to go to seed anyway, but you're just getting such beautiful quality leaves off your beetroot anyway. There's not a lot of need and you know, beetroot leaves and chard leaves are pretty much the same. So then I will do a couple of batches of radish. I won't really talk about those very much, just cherry bell. And again, they'll probably go in the polytunnel. And then it comes to the lettuce. Well, I've got a lot of lettuce already in the ground. And I've got a lot of lettuce that I'm harvesting here uh, out of the polytunnel, just really for when the weather's really rubbish on the allotment. And I don't really want to go down there and harvest. So I've just got enough here for a few weeks of harvest. I've got lots up here in these hanging baskets as well. So I've got enough to sort of keep me going for a few weeks. 
but I've got plenty of lettuce on the allotment. So the reason that I start these lettuces in January is because I like to clear my lettuce beds, my overwintered lettuce beds, and get them replanted with something else. And I'm often sort of replanting with brassicas for spring. And I've got a lot of these brassicas in here, which I'll talk about later. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just one of my things. I'm not so keen on eating the same varieties of lettuce all the way through winter and then all the way through sort of spring. I'd much prefer to have my winter varieties and then my favorite spring varieties in spring. So that's the reason that I've got these and I'm growing uh, Rickia, Navara, Grenoble Red and Canasta and a Red Lolo as well. So Lolo Rossa. So that's a really nice selection. And then we've come on to all the Asian greens. So we love Asian greens again. We eat them every week of the year, pretty much. Um, maybe not in the mid summer. And I'm doing Komatsuma, Red Pat Choi, uh, Red, well, it's labeled Red Tatsoi, but it's actually more of a Pat Choi and True Tatsoi. So a nice selection. A lot of those go into cooking, uh, stir fry greens, things like that, soups and stuff, but quite a lot go into salad mixes as well. And I particularly like myself, the Komatsuma in salad mixes, uh, but the red stemmed varieties, you know, they look, look just beautiful in the salads as well. I've already got <laughs> lots of uh, Asian greens in the ground, but what I find is they tend to go to seed end of February, sorry, end of January, early February. So these plants will be in the ground growing strongly by and probably ready for harvest towards the end of February. So I might get a continuity of supply. I might not, depending on when those other plants go to seed. And you're never quite sure when they're going to go to seed because it's so weather dependent. It could easily be sort of three weeks difference uh, from year to year. Anyway, that's the Asian greens. And then we come on to the salad onions. So most of my salad onions are overwintering. I've got them up, they're all outside and there's quite a lot in this kitchen garden here. And they're looking okay, but I think it's because we eat salad onions every day, we really can't take a risk with them. So we start some in January, and we've also got some down here that I started in December, and looking quite nice. But I'm not, never quite sure you know, whether I'm gonna need them or not. Because if the ones that are outside happen to do really well, because we have a decent winter, uh, and they don't get any rust or whatever in spring, and then I'll have loads of salad onions. And so what I tend to do is at this time of year, I'm always sowing varieties of onions that work well as a salad onion, but also can be left to bulb up nicely and give us kind of smallish bulbs like this sort of size in spring and early summer. And of course, those are absolutely gorgeous. And I don't know whether you noticed in the supermarkets, they tend to do this now. And they're selling like a bunch of three little onions for like a pound or one pound fifty or something. And so, you know, I've got basically the sort of equivalent there. So in each of these trays, I've got like 50 pounds worth, so 100 pounds worth of onions there. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a real treat to have those as mini onions uh, rather than sort of bunching onions or scallions or whatever you want to call them if I don't need them. And if I do need them as salad onions a bit earlier in the year, then that's fine. I'll just pick them uh, as, like that as well. So I hope you followed that. <laughs> but basically, the bulbing onions that I'm growing as salad onions are Lilia, Sturon, and uh, North Holland Blood Red. So later on in the year, sort of late February sort of time, that's when I switch over to true salad onions. Um, and uh, yeah, I do that because I do like salad onions as well as bulbing onions. You know, I just think that salad onions are so uniquely crunchy and crispy and easy to eat and milder. So leeks. I don't do most of my leeks until about April. All the ones that we're eating now were sown back there. I've got loads down there in, in that bed behind me, for example, and lots on the allotment. Um, but I do like a few leeks in summer. For spring, we tend to eat elephant garlic 
leek stems, which are very leek-like. Elephant garlic being in the leek family, you know, basically the stem is effectively a leek. So we grow a lot of elephant garlic, so it's really easy for us to just take a few of those stems uh, in sort of May time, when we've pretty much finished with all of our overwintered leeks. So we've got a little bit of a gap before these leeks here are ready. Um, but I'll do another batch in January as well. I just sow in as many leeks as I need for that month in the summer right now. And as I say, for my main crop leeks, I leave them for a lot longer. I find that uh, they're more reliable that way, get less diseases. And of course, they're not taking up any bed space. They're just in little pots. So uh, that works well. So that is everything that I'm doing in January. And I'll do another video as a kind of preview of what I'm going to do in February uh, as well. And you should see that in a day or two. So that's everything from me. My name's Steve. This is the Seaside Kitchen Garden and Allotment Channel. And I'll see you soon.